Hello again, Cougar Nation. Welcome to another edition of VoiceOver with uh, Greg and Shep, Greg Rubel, Jason Shepard. It's our pleasure to be joined this week by ESPN and Pac-12 Network broadcaster, Roxy Bernstein. Roxy, good to see you, even though it's seeing you this way. It's, I guess, good and bad, right, Greg? Because we're all kind of locked up and doing our social distancing thing. And it, it's a weird time for us, considering what's going on in the world. And now you're coming to us from the Bay Area, right? Yep, I am in the Bay Area where we've been on, I've basically been on lockdown in my house or self-quarantining since I got back from Las Vegas in the Pac-12 tournament, what, March 12th. So it's been going on three plus weeks now. And I want to get us started in Las Vegas, but San Francisco was really one, maybe the first major city to go with lockdown and, and surrounding counties were soon to follow. So you were, you were caught up in that, right? Yeah, it happened early in the week. I want to say right around like right around St. Patrick's Day. Like that's when I think that the Bay Area took the aggressive stance. And you mentioned the city of San Francisco and the governor or the, the mayor of San Francisco, London Breed. Then all the surrounding counties. I live in San Mateo County, which is south of San Francisco. I'm basically in between like halfway in between Stanford and the city of San Francisco. I'm right near the airport. So in San Mateo County, where there's been all seven Bay Area counties were on lockdown basically ever since that mid-March date. And I think it's helped out immensely here in this area because we haven't seen the growth of the coronavirus here in this area that we've seen in some other hot spots like, for example, New York. And I trust that uh, you and the family remained uh, well throughout? We, we have. Everything has been great. Uh, we've been healthy. It's weird because I'm not necessarily a hypochondriac at all, but anytime I had a little, like, uh-oh, like, I, I got worried for whatever reason, especially coming back from Vegas where there were so many people in and out. Like, my allergies started acting up pretty good, but they always do this time of the year. And I was getting nervous. I'm like, oh, no, what's going on? And luckily, it was just my allergies and everything's been good. All right, so, so let's backtrack about, about four weeks now. Uh, I last saw you in Vegas. You were there to do both the WCC and then – the Pac-12 tournaments because WCC was going to wrap up followed by followed by Pac-12. As it turns out, Rocks, WCC is the last real brand name basketball conference to have completed its tournament and crowned a champion. That was on a Tuesday night. Pac-12 began the next day. You were involved there. And that was really the last day of basketball um, for the Pac-12 and for much of the country. Can you Take us back to the, uh, I guess, looking back now, kind of surreal few days you spent uh, in Las Vegas. Surreal is the right word, Greg, because, okay, we're, we're going on, but you get a sense of what's going on with the virus throughout the world, right? Globally, you're getting information. So Wednesday, I did the two day games on Wednesday, March 11th. That was my daughter's birthday, so I knew, you know, because I remember the date exactly. So we do the Oregon-Utah game, which was at noon. And then the 2.30 game of working with Don McClain uh, was Arizona and Washington. I go back, I change, and I was going to come back and watch the evening session. My alma mater, Cal, was playing Stanford at 6 o'clock. And, 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 and there's no reason why I cooped up do work in your hotel room when I could just do work courtside, which I did. And just following social media and Twitter, and as the evening was progressing – Every five minutes, you would just like was jaw dropping. Something would happen. You're going, oh my gosh! And then, of course, the news. I think that really hit everybody is when Rudy Gobert was announced tested positive. You saw what happened in Oklahoma City with the Jazz and the game being postponed, and then the ramifications. And then, lo and behold, not too long after that, Adam Silver says we're suspending the NBA. So at that point, you had a pretty good indication that this may be the last day of basketball in terms of as we know it for the time being. Well, and as it pertains to college basketball, about a week ago, we, we got the official word from the NCAA that, that spring sports were going to get another year of eligibility. And, and there was, I think, maybe a small amount of hope that maybe some of the winter teams were. But I think we all knew how that was going to play out. How do you – how do you – when you think about that situation for these teams that their season ended like that, how do you, how do you sort of uh, digest that information and the way that that season ended for them? 
It stinks. It, it really does. But I don't know if there is a solution. I, I don't think that you can go back and all the seniors give them another chance. Like, for example, you look on the women's side, right? Sabrina Ionescu, one of the most decorated players in the history of college basketball. She came back to the University of Oregon for one reason, and that was to win a national championship. She had the, the bitter taste in her mouth from losing in the Final Four as a junior. She comes back with that great group, and it gets taken away from her. And a lot of seniors, you look at the great senior late in BYU team, for example, we'll never know how far they could have gone in the NCAA tournament. And it's awful, but I, I, I don't know if there is a solution that would have made everybody happy, to be honest with you. We're seeing with the spring sports, and there's going to be some issues with rosters and scholarship numbers, and there's people much smarter than me trying to figure this thing out. And I get that because, like, for example, baseball is a sport I do for the spring for ESPN. Well, we only had, what, about three or four weeks of a season, and that's it. So you can understand from that standpoint, but you just feel for the seniors that they came back maybe for this particular reason. Yoli Childs, for example, comes back, and then it had to sit out the nine games at the start of the year, which is still ludicrous to me. And I think it was one of the reasons that he could make a deep run with the team that BYU had coming back and have an impact in Mark Pope's first year. And you look around all these programs, we'll never know. It's, that's going to be, unfortunately, the story of the 1920 college basketball season, guys, is we'll never know what would have happened. And it's unfortunate, for example, BYU has that ugly taste in their mouth. from They didn't play well. And that's going to happen at times. You're just not going to play well. And every night is not going to be your night. That's what makes the NCAA tournament so great is that you have to be on top of your game for six games. You have to be sharp. You can't take a possession off here or there. And it'll come back to haunt you. And, for example, the WCC tournament, St. Mary's found a way to, to get it done. And then Gonzaga took care of them in the, in the championship game. But for a team like that, for a team like Colorado, that had such great seasons to end so disappointingly, I think it leaves a bitter taste in their mouth, but it can't be overlooked how great their seasons were and what these teams accomplished. So I mentioned off the top, uh, I call you an ESPN and Pac-12 network broadcaster. It kind of scratches the surface of all the different responsibilities you have uh, over the course of a given year. What was your spring going to look yeah. like had things continued uh, normally? I had a full slate of games, Greg. Um, you know, I was slated to do the Big West Championship game uh, from the Pac-12. So I do the first two days of the Pac-12. Then for ESPN, I head to Anaheim. I was supposed to do that. Obviously, that got canceled. I never made it to Southern California. Uh, then I was supposed to jump right into the NIT, as ESPN has it. I usually do a game in each round up until uh, the semis and championships. So somewhere around the West Coast, hopefully I would have been. And then it's smack dab in the middle of baseball. And there was West Coast Conference baseball games I was supposed to do that one in April, I think one in May. Uh, BYU was one of them at Gonzaga, I think on a Thursday night. Yeah. Uh, but I was also supposed to do Major League Baseball. And I was supposed to be in Houston for opening day. Not that there was a shortage of storylines to talk about with the Astros on opening day. Right. But I was supposed to be there for ESPN radio and then head to Florida to do some SEC baseball for ESPN. And I also work for the Oakland A's. And now, for the first time, I, I can't ever remember having a calendar with nothing on it, nothing to do. And I don't know when something will get written in that calendar for me to start working again. It's crazy. Well, I, I, it's a perfect I, I know you have – sorry, Jeff. Chef, I, I know that Roxy has vacation time. But, I, I, yeah. but, but, but besides vacation time, this has to be the longest stretch – where you've not left town for something, right? Yeah. It's maybe during the summer, it does get a little quieter. And for example, last summer, I didn't do as much traveling with the A's. The majority of my games with them were at home, which I'm not going to complain about. But you're right. I, I've been home now consistently for, what, three to four weeks. It's never happened before. And it's, I think my wife's getting ready to throw me out of the house. <laughs> uh, luckily, the weather's been good enough. We've had some rainstorms here in the Bay Area, but I can get out and go for some walks. And that's the extent of me leaving the house right now. And no travel. There is no new games to prepare for or watch. And it's uh, all I can do is read, just try to be prepared for when we do actually start yeah. up again, which I hope is some point sooner rather than later. But who knows the way things are shaping up. 
how has your appreciation and passion for sports and sports broadcasting changed without having an outlet for either right now? I think everybody's passion for sports has changed. <laughs> I, I, this is how sick I am. They're, you know, they're doing some spring training games over in Korea. Uh, and I've been watching some inner squad baseball on YouTube from uh, the Korean professional league, just to have some semblance of live sports. Hey, you don't need to apologize for that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And I, as many of us, I can't understand a word they're saying during the broadcast. It's kind of, I find it entertaining, but oh my God, there's live baseball to watch. And, uh, you know, I tried, okay, maybe do I start getting into the WWE because there's something that's going on that's live right now. Uh, but that's, that's about it, right? I mean, we have nothing. I'm watching a lot of old games. I'll, I'll stumble across this and I can't turn it off. And like this morning I was watching, uh, I think a 1987 NBA playoff game between the Houston Rockets and the Seattle Sonics. That goes to show you where I'm at right now. And th this is like a daily occurrence. Like yesterday I found myself watching, uh, I think a game from the 1987 world series between the twins and the Cardinal. I mean, this, this is what we're stuck with right now. Unfortunately, this is our reality. And there's been a lot of good hockey to watch also on the NHL network. And they're replaying some of the great Bay area games over the years on the local sports stations, whether it's the A's giants, the sharks warriors. So there, there's plenty of stuff. Oh, I can remember this game, but that's, that's our sports outlet right now. Your, your hockey allegiance pretty clear. You have the sharks hoodie and the sharks Jersey behind you. So. Yeah, it's been, it's been a rough season after some great years and, uh, this year I was so expecting it to be a chance for the cup. And I guess if there was any year that they're going to, if they're going to postpone everything and cancel everything, this might've been the year for both the Warriors and the Sharks. So, so you're a Bay area guy. Uh, you mentioned Cal is your alma mater and I want to make sure I get the dates right on this. So my, my first season as the full-time BYU basketball play-by-play -play guy was 1997, 98. Was that also your first season with Cal? Yep, that was my first year also. I filled in uh, the previous year, did some games. Uh, it was Ben Braun's first year when Cal went to the Sweet 16 in 1996-97. Ted Robinson, who I work with at the Pac-12 Network, was the radio voice of Cal, but had to miss a few games. I got to fill in. He gave it up after the year, and like you, that was my first season. That's so weird, because the year before, 96-97, was Paul James's, uh, he, he was still, Paul James was still the guy for BYU. He had some health issues, so I stepped in. And so he and I split games that year. He called it quits for hoops at the end of that year. And I, and, and, and then I, I started full-time the very next year. That was your first year. And BYU played Cal in 1997-98 at the Pete Newell Classic at the arena in Oakland. And, and, uh, and, and so um, I think, I guess that would have been the first time we would have crossed paths regardless yeah. of whether or not we are aware of it. And then a few years later, a series came about mm -hmm. and in 03, 04, I came to Haas Pavilion and you were still, you know, as new as I was in the job, relatively speaking. And, and uh, BYU and Cal played a 47, 46 barn burner. Thriller. I, I went Although back. We didn't have a buzzer beater, luckily for my golden bears. It, it was Amit Tamir, I think. Amit Tamir. That, and, well, actually, and, it's funny. I was I, we did a family trip to Israel a couple summers ago, and Amit lives in Israel, and I met up with Amit on the trip. And so I remember that was it Araujo at, at BYU at that point? Yeah, he didn't have a great game. Hoff, I had I think nine points that night, and and both teams combined to make literally <laughs> each made one field goal in the final six minutes of the game, and it ended forty seven forty six. Cal, an instant classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But then we came back to, I think it was the Marriott Center the next year, and BYU handled us pretty good. So one of the things, Roxy, that I, I love about these, these little bit longer form interviews that we get to do is beyond just talking about games and things like that, we get a little bit, uh, maybe a peek behind the curtain. And this may be common knowledge to a lot of people. It is not common knowledge to me. So I wanted to ask you, Roxy is not your given name. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the story behind Roxy? Because I've always been curious about that. So Alan is my given name. Uh, before I was born, my mom, when she was pregnant with me, like six or seven months, and like at three o'clock in the morning, she gets up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. My dad, half asleep, kind of rolls over and says, hey, Roxy, where are you going? And my mom was like, who's Roxy? <laughs> And it was my dad's golf caddy. 
So my dad used to be a pretty good semi-pro golfer, maybe could have gone that route. Instead, he went into the business world. But Roxy was his caddy. And so sure enough, from that point on, they didn't know what they were having if I was a boy or a girl. And it just stuck. I was going to be called Roxy, even though I'm named after my great-grandfather who had passed away. Uh, his name was Samuel Allen Bernstein. I'm Alan Samuel. But I've always gone by Roxy. And I was always known even before I was born as Roxy. And it just stuck all the way through. And I've never really, I've never gone by Alan. It kind of has helped me at times. Like, for example, you know, telemarketers calling the house or people <laughs> looking, is Alan there? Oh, no, he's not here. Can I take a message for you? Uh, but even in school, growing up, and it's always been my name, and it just stuck, and I, I think it's fitting, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't think necessarily consider myself an Alan. That's a great story. I, like I said, I, I figure a lot of people probably knew the story, because I'm sure you've been asked plenty of times about it, but I had never heard the story, and I was always curious, <laughs> what, what, was, what was the origin of the name? Yeah, it's not the given name. People, they, they, like, people who didn't know me, like, wait, what's your name again? Who, who are you? Yeah. So it maybe takes people a little while. Like, I remember, like, even in school, like, for example, I remember I, I switched schools, uh, transferred schools in high school. And I remember my first day of my new high school, and it was a smaller pr private school that I ended up finishing up from. And I went there, and I sat down in my math class, and the geometry teacher goes, she, she already had a seating chart laid out, and I sat down where it says, Roxy Bernstein, sit here. And she looks at me and says, you're not Roxy. I go, yes, I am. No, Roxy's a girl's name. I'm like, it's my name too. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I've had to live with that a little bit. Sure, I got teased a little bit, but it's all good. I'm, I'm cool with it. That's so awesome. I, I, I'm a few years older than you. Uh, not, not, not too many. Um, but sooner, you know, you, you're going to hit 50 at some point here coming up. Um, probably still a couple years away for you. Uh, I, I don't think you look 50. Uh, I hope I don't look. I hope I don't look the way I, or hope I don't uh, um, look my age. I kind of feel younger. Uh, sports, I think, kind of helps keep you young. And, and uh, I, I think being around the games um, just kind of makes age just a number in a lot of ways. Uh, do, do you think there's any credence to that? And, and does the, your choice of profession keep you feeling young? I think it does. There's also the Greg, and we got to take care of ourselves on the road, eat well try to get our rest if possible. And, you know, I, obviously I travel a ton and that can drain you. When I look at our business and work, that's the work for me is when I'm on airplanes, I'm in and out of rental, car, rental cars, hotels. I'm, I'm not at home. I'm missing stuff, which we all do in our business. And it's, you know, there's the give and take and it's the career path we've chosen. And we have to very understanding families that get it. And luckily we do. But I do agree with you that it does keep us young. It does keep us full of energy because uh, there's always that next game to look forward to. And the next group of kids that comes in or we get to meet with. And we get to deal with great coaches, whether it's in the West Coast Conference, the Pac-12, whatever we deal with, there's great people along the way, which also help. For example, there's friendships I've had over the years. And for example, when we go to Provo, we'll sometimes we'll go to dinner before games, or if I have BYU on the road, we'll meet up. Um, you know my relationship with Tom Holmo. Tom and I go back a long way. Uh, but that always helps. And when I'm in town, see if I'm able to keep up on friendships, which is good. And in a lot of ways, it, it, it does make up for some of the stuff that I'm missing. Anytime I have a road trip in L.A., for example, my brother lives in L.A. and his family. I stay with them. I don't even stay at a hotel. He lives kind of near UCLA. So these are some of the perks that I have. Uh, it doesn't necessarily substitute for what I would be getting at home, but I, I think it does lead into the fact that keeps us young, keeps us fresh. And for me, w when I get to get to the next game, boom, all of a sudden there's two new teams I'm getting ready for. And I think that's where the excitement, and we get that rush every time we walk in, especially when it's a big game. And the crowd and the energy that's in there helps us. And that's what we're dealing with here is, would have been a little weird because I was getting prepared to call the Big West semifinals and championship in Anaheim with no crowd. That was, the Big West is one of the first leagues to come out and say, all right, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna close the door no fans, just play the games. And I was trying to figure out how I was going to prepare for that. 
Um, we didn't obviously have to do that, but that would have been very weird because of how much, at least for me, Greg, and maybe for you the same way, you feed off the crowd, the energy, especially on a big game, really, I think, can bring the best out of us. Well, and the fun thing about this year's BYU basketball team, there was a lot, there were a lot of those games where you had, I mean, you had big games that meant something in Provo. Obviously, the biggest of them all was, was the game against Gonzaga where BYU was able to get that win. But you've obviously, as you mentioned, been to Provo many, many times. What's, what's been your experience in terms of calling games at the Marriott Center? And then what have been your, your experiences this year with this team and, and what you thought was possible? Well, I only had, it's funny, I only had BYU on the road this year. I, I didn't have them at home. So I had the game, for example, at St. Mary's. And that was without Yoli, but that was a fun game. And it went to overtime, and it was back and forth. And, and, but over the years, I've always loved it, whether now with Mark Pope and getting to know Dave Rose over the years and working with Dave uh, at the WCC tournament. And his teams were always so fun to watch. Not, and not necessarily the great players, the Collinsworths, the Hawes, is two of them that he had. You go on and on. But it was always fun. And I always looked forward to the energy, even if it necessarily wasn't a big game, for example, at the Marriott Center, right? Okay, when they would host the University of San Diego, who wasn't good at the time, for example, on a Thursday night. And there was 12,000 in the Marriott Center as opposed to the overflow crowd when I've been there for games against Utah or St. Mary's or Gonzaga. But it's still fun and the energy. But when the number one memory for me was doing the Utah game there, gosh, it had to be, what, three or four years ago now? Um, right after the series had been interrupted and the f resumption of it, Utah at BYU and and the crowd was just frothing at the mouth, the energy. I'm doing the game with Bill Walton. <laughs> and it was so intense in there, and the energy, and the crowd was all over Larry when he took the floor in that bright red jacket. And you know, using his comments, that's not safe, and calling him 80K for, you know, what happened. But that's what's great, and that's the number one memory for me, just the way that crowd and the energy was that night. That epitomizes what college basketball and college sports is about. Hey, so, since you brought Bill up, what's one thing a play-by-play -play guy just has to surrender himself to when doing a game with Bill Walton? That you know this night is going to be different, no matter what. And I have great partners. I love working with Sean Farnham and, and Corey Williams. And you go on and on the list of ESPN broadcasters that I work with, or in the Pac-12 with, with Don McClain or – Matt Muehlbach, you go on and on and on. It's just different working with Bill. And you know that going in. And no matter what I prepare for, I'm not going to be ready for it because I have no idea where he's going to take it. <laughs> and he doesn't clue me in before the game. And you've seen it when we're there at shoot-arounds. He'll sit at one end of the arena and I'll sit at the other. We won't talk. We won't converse. I, even if I walk in, I, I might say, hey, Bill, good morning. He looks at me. I know you, you're a rock, <laughs> you know, his shtick that he does. I'm Bill with two L's. Yeah, Bill, we're going to do a game. Bill, how, how's it going? Save it for air. He doesn't even want to talk to me. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the beginning of our day. Doesn't yeah. want to talk to me. And so then he'll sit there and, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll hijack the coach so I can't get any words in and talk to the coach and because I got to be the other end of the gym and, and he'll prepare, I'll prepare, and then we lights on at whatever time and get ready to do the game and just be ready for whatever he's going to throw at me, and I have no idea what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. But the challenge of working with Bill is fun. It's awesome. It's different, but it's fun at the same time. And he, he's a treasure. He really is. And, you know, to pull the curtain back on Bill, he's brilliant. He really is. Like, with what he does, he knows exactly what he's doing, right? Whether the fan is getting ready to throw the remote control at the television at home or they eat up when Bill and all his ramblings and what he says, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's inciting a reaction in you at home, and that's what he's going for. He just doesn't want to be the cookie-cutter broadcaster, all right, break down a play. You know, he can do that if he wants to, but he's going for the entertainment value, and it works, and that's why he's unique and just one of a kind. And it's funny, the, the night before that 
BYU Utah game years ago. I, I had a game on the Friday night, the night before. So I flew in the morning into Salt Lake City. It was a nine o'clock tip, I remember, mountain time. So I had plenty of time to get down for shoot arounds and I was there. But the night before, Bill, I may go to dinner with Bill the night before if we're in town, but I wasn't there. So Bill had nothing to do. So he was asking me, hey, where should I go to dinner in Provo? And I said, I've got the solution for you. So I sent him to dinner with Tom Homo the night before. And they went to dinner there in Provo at that uh, Brazilian steakhouse. Um, Gano's? I, 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 yeah, that's where he took him. Yeah. So they go. And then after the dinner, I get a text from Tom telling me, now I know and understand the method to Bill's madness. <laughs> because all throughout dinner, Bill is peppering Tom with question after question about BYU, about the staff. Not just, you know, wanting to know, for example, Dave Rose and his coaches, but the strength and conditioning coach, the athletic trainer, the doctor, what's going on in, in Provo, what's going on with BYU, and the history of everything. And he is furiously taking notes at dinner with Tom, and Tom now understands how Bill gets a lot of his information. And the thing you got to know is you've ever at dinner with Bill or you talk to him, there's always a chance, no matter what you tell them, it's going to end up on the air that night. It's been a pleasure seeing you over the years, getting to know you. And I, I know one of the things we'll never do again is, is go to a Rush show together. We, we've done that a few times oh. over the years. And, and, and Rush is Great no show more. in Salt Lake City on the, or on the yeah. R40 tour. Oh, that was yeah. legendary. With uh, Neil Peart's passing this, this, uh, in the last few months, um, that era of music has ended, so we'll not do that again. But I know we'll be in the same we'll be we'll be in the same building again at some point, and, and I look forward to seeing you at the next game uh, we end up doing when when games are played again. So, uh, hey, thanks for taking the time uh, today just to chat with us. And I've got time, Greg. I know you said you have some you have yeah, you have some space in the schedule. I'm glad you fit us in. No, my pleasure. It's always great to catch up, and I do look forward to seeing you at some point here in the near future.